Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I get into my questions, um, I, I just want to bring up something that I'd heard earlier, and I'm a bit surprised that the minority is uh, criticizing this committee for having so many hearings on a piece of legislation that is very important to Americans. Um, look, debate, careful consideration, and transparency is the hallmark of American legislative process. I look out at the crowd here and I can see people who are probably on both sides of this issue. However, it's, it's testimony that this many people are here to hear logical, debate and consideration. Now, I probably shouldn't be surprised because in the last Congress, this committee was handed an 884-page election overhaul bill that was rushed through by the Democrats. 884 pages long. We had two hearings, two short hearings, and no markup before it was rushed to the House floor. This bill is one-sixth of the size of that bill. We've had seven hearings, including today. We've got uh, more scheduled to come. I don't see that as a problem. I see that as doing things the right and proper way. Now, with that said, Mr. Cuccinelli, Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution grants primary authority to states to run elections how they see fit and gives Congress purely a secondary role. Why is that important? Well, I would add one item as to why it's important that it gets rarely discussed and sort of comes from my old DHS hat, and that is the simple matter of, you know, we've had comments from myself included about election interference. If you have 51 different elections picking your president, we'll take the one national election, um, it is the security equivalent of a diversified financial portfolio. If you hack a state, you've hacked one state. If H.R. 1 and H.R. 4 of the previous Congress had become law, you'd have had one big election system. You hack one election system, you can actually affect outcomes much more easily. Um, the, the more you hack more states, the more likely you are to get caught. That is a high, high deterrent for a nation state. Um, so that, that is a very little discussed benefit to the states running elections. They are all done differently, District of Columbia included, um, and that's a real benefit for American security. But under our current Constitution, and I know some want to change this, the District of Columbia is subject to congressional authority, correct? Yes. And, and I'm going to divert a little bit because of something that was asked earlier. Um, we were talking, the chairman was talking about foreign nationals, you know, that, that live here. Now they can vote in D.C. <sighs> Mr. Cuccinelli, I know you're an attorney. Do we have foreign nationals that do live in the United States that are not citizens? Millions of them. Do we have those that have permanently made the United States their residency or their domicile that are not U.S. citizens? Millions of them. Let me read to you what the qualifications for the office of mayor in the District of Columbia currently are. No person shall hold the office of mayor unless he is a qualified elector. Would someone that we described, the chairman described earlier, that may be a foreign national that worked at the Russian embassy but now just decided to stay in D.C. and because of our current status of not uh, just allowing anybody to come to the country and stay here would not force them to leave. Is that a scenario that's possible? And would that person be a qualified elector? Under the current definition. Second qualification has resided and domiciled in the district for one year, immediately preceding the day on which the general or special election for mayor is to be held. Is that scenario possible, that someone who is a former employee of the Russian or Chinese embassy decided to stay in the United States, is qualified to vote in the District of Columbia, could run for mayor of the District of Columbia? Absolutely. Has not been convicted of a felony while holding the office, and then it talks talks about various types of employment. Now, I'm not an attorney, but I can read some legal documents. And from what I'm seeing here, I could be wrong, it could be something else in, in the code book for the District of Columbia, but what I'm reading right here directly off the District of Columbia's qualifications is that someone who is a, has worked for an adversary to the United States could run and become mayor of the District of Columbia. Correct. Is that what you read? Yes. 
Uh, I'll submit my other questions for the rest record to Mr. Chairman. I yield back.